If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Listeners, we will get to introductions, but before we do that, I am sitting here with Jay Connor. And Jay, I want to ask you, tell us something that you believe about raising private money that might surprise listeners. Oh, my lands, Jonathan. When it comes to the world of private money, here's exactly that will something that will surprise your listeners. And that is you can raise hundreds of thousands of dollars and millions of dollars in private money, just like I have without ever asking anybody for money. And people ask me all the time, they say, Jay, how in the world do you have eight and a half million dollars in private money that you just moved from one real estate project to another without ever asking anybody for money? Jonathan, I really want to dig into that topic while we hang out together here on your show. Listeners, welcome to the source of commercial real estate where we talk to the experts in commercial real estate so you can grow your business find a competitive advantage and use real estate to live the life that you want. I am your host, Jonathan Hayek. I'm a former public school teacher who found financial freedom through residential real estate investing. And now I'm focused on larger commercial properties, particularly small industrial. And today I have the privilege of talking with Jay Connor. Jay has literally raised millions of dollars in private money. He's known as the private money authority, and we are going to get into the specifics of how private money can benefit you in your real estate portfolio. Jay, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you doing? Jonathan, I'm fantastic right here in Eastern North Carolina at the beach where the sun is shining the temperatures are about 86 degrees. We got a beautiful South wind coming off the ocean and I'm enjoying life in this world of real estate and using private money to fund my deals. Well, Jay, I'm happy to be talking with you today. Why don't we start the conversation with you telling us a little bit about your background, how you got started in real estate and using private money and what your work looks like today. Sure. Well, my wife, Carol Joy, and I, we've been investing in real estate, uh, primarily single family houses, but we've also done a number of commercial deals. Um, we've got a shopping center that we built up from the ground up, condominiums, townhouses, uh, and single family houses, rehabbed over 500 single family houses, all using private money. But you know, Jonathan, it didn't start out that way. Uh, it never does, does it? Uh, we started investing in single family houses in 2003 full time. We're in a very, very small market. Only 40,000 people is our total market. And from 2003, Jonathan, until January, 2009, the very first six years that we were in the business, I relied on local banks, institutional money to fund my real estate deals. That's all I knew to do. When I had a deal, all I knew to do was to go to the local bank, get on my hands and knees, put my hands underneath my chin and beg and lift up my skirt so the banker could look at my personal assets and my verification of income and my credit score and decide if I was going to get the funding or not. They were in control. They were in the driver's seat. The lender at that time for the first six years, they set the interest rate. They set the length of the note, et cetera. They made all the rules. And you know, that's what most people are accustomed to. That's all they know is, a, you know, uh, you have to play by the lender's rules. Well, Jonathan, I have discovered, and it probably has happened in your career as well. There's a pivotal moment that comes along. There's something that happens in your business that changes everything. And here it was in January, 2009, I was sitting here at my desk. I had two houses under contract to buy and I called up my banker. His name was Steve and Steve and I, he had been funding my deals for six years. We had a great business relationship and I called him up. I told him about these two deals that were under contract to buy. And I learned just like that over the phone that my line of credit had been shut down. 
I said, Steve, what in the world are you saying? My line of credit's been shut down. And by the way, this was no, with no notice. He says, Jay, don't you know there's a global financial crisis going on right now? I said, no, but now you've just given me a global financial crisis by cutting me off with no notice. I said, um, why are you cutting me off? He says, well, we're just not loaning money out to real estate investors anymore due to what's going on in the markets. So Jonathan, I, I, I put the phone uh, back down on the receiver and I sat here for a moment and I asked myself a very important question. And this question that I'm going to share with your audience right now will help you fix any problem in your life, whether it's financial, personal relationships, health, it doesn't matter. And here's the question I asked myself. I said, who can help me with my problem? And immediately I thought of Jeff Blankenship, good friend of mine and Carol Joyce, who was living in Greensboro, North Carolina at the time, investing in real estate. And I called him up and I told him that I had just been cut off with the bank and lost my line of credit. He said, well, Jay, welcome to the club. And I said, what club is that? He said, the club of being cut off at the bank. I just lost my line of credit last week. I said, well, Jeff, how are you going to fund your deals? He said, well, have you ever heard of uh, private money? And I said, no. He said, have you ever heard of self-directed IRAs and how people can use their retirement funds uh, to be private lenders to invest in your deals? I said, no. And so because of that conversation, I learned about private money. I learned about how people can use their retirement funds to be a passive real estate investor. And Jonathan, I put my program together and I raised $2,150,000 in less than 90 days right here in our little local area. And so that was the biggest blessing in disguise that I've had in this business of being cut off from the local bank. And so, you know, I mentioned uh, when you first started visiting with me about I, how I've raised all this private money without ever asking anybody for money. Here's the answer to that question as to how in the world that happened. I became what you were, Jonathan, before you got into real estate. I became a teacher and I put on what I call my private money teacher hat. And I simply started teaching people in my own network, my own connections, what private money is. And by the way, when I say private money, I'm talking about individuals, human beings that are loaning money from their investment capital and or their retirement accounts to us real estate investors. So I just simply started teaching people what private money is and how they can earn high rates of return. I started employing what I call the direct method and the indirect method of teaching people and how to attract the money. And so since that time in January, 2009, I've continued to teach people what private money is. You know, here's what's interesting, Jonathan. I've got 47 private lenders right now that are funding our deals and not one of them had ever heard of private money or private lending until I put on my teacher hat. And I taught them what it is. And I taught them my program as to how they can get these high rates of return. And so, you know, what I love about this world is when you start teaching people that have never heard about this world of private money, it puts you in the driver's seat. You don't have to ask for money. The money chases you and there's no negotiation. You set the interest rate, you set the terms and you as the borrower make the rules. Really interesting stuff, Jay. And before we go on any further, you alluded to uh, sort of the definition of what we're talking about, but I want to get really clear on what we mean by private money. Um, there are lots of people have lots of different different definitions for private money, but when we're talking about private money, are you also including hard money in this? Um, any just non bank lenders, or what exactly do you mean by private money? So what I mean by private money is non-NON, non-institutional money. By the way, I say make as many relationships as you can with as many people. Some of my best friends in the world are hard money lenders. Um, and as a matter of fact, they've used my techniques and strategies to raise more private money for investors to invest in their funds. It's all the same money. Whether you're raising money for, you know, your hard money fund or you're raising money for 
uh, apartments or, you know, commercial deals or you're raising money for single family houses. It's all the same money. It's a matter of, you know, what's being structured and what they're investing in. So in answer to your question, Jonathan, my world of private money that I'm talking about is doing business with individuals, non-institutional money, people that are using their investment capital and or their retirement funds to invest in our real estate deals. And these are all ordinary people. For example, of the 47 private lenders that we have that are investing in and funding our deals, I'll give you one example of a couple that are from Mississippi. I'm in North Carolina. They're in Mississippi. They are both, just like your former career, Jonathan, they are both retired school teachers from Mississippi, one of the states that, unfortunately, school teachers are paid the least amount in the nation. And this couple has got $1,250,000 with me in our deals from being retired school teachers in Mississippi. What's the point of that story? All my 47 private lenders, not one of them had ever heard of private money or self-directed IRAs until I taught them about it. And number two, they are ordinary people. Who are my private lenders? They are school teachers. I got another school teacher right here in Moorhead City, North Carolina. That's one of my private lenders that's going to be retiring next year. Um, they are uh, civil service workers. I've got two private lenders that have retired work in civil service. These are ordinary people that don't know what to do with their money to get really high rates of return. Um, now, there's three categories of where you find private lenders, people that are in your own connections, people that are in what I call your expanded warm market, because your own connections are going to run out. So how do you expand your network? The third category are existing private lenders. This past Saturday, I was a keynote speaker at a self-directed annual uh, self-directed IRA annual conference. Well, my lands, over 70% of account holders at a self-directed IRA company want to loan money to us real estate investors. But guess what? I can't put on my teacher hat and teach them private money because they already know what private money is. They're already loaning money out. So now if I borrow money from those people, which I can, that's a negotiation process. I'd much rather be borrowing money from people that I have taught what it's all about to where it's not a negotiation process to where they are just loving the program that I'm offering and they become involved. But those are the three different categories as to where you find private lenders. I really like your uh, differentiation between, um, you know, institutional type lenders where you go to them and they tell you the rate and terms versus private money. You are telling the private money lender what you're willing to offer, what types of returns you're willing to offer. And I'll add that private money has been instrumental to me um, as I've built my portfolio. And the the differentiation that I make between private money and hard money is, you know, hard money is is more institutional. You call up maybe an 800 number or something, and you have to give them, uh, you know, information about your deal, and they'll tell you, okay, well, we're at 12 and two or 15 and five, and and they tell you the terms. There's, you know, there's often very high interest rate uh, accompanied by uh, very high uh, origination fees, and you don't have a pre-existing relationship with with that hard money lender. It's more transactional versus. In my experience, private money has been with friends and family, and it's more of a conversation. You have a pre-existing relationship, and you're saying, hey, this is the deal. This is what I can offer if, if you'd like to invest in it. And, and it's more of a, um, you know, a, a collaboration and a cooperation towards, uh, towards a common goal. Um, and so I, I think I agree with you that private money, a lot of my private lenders that I've used have also been unaware that this is a thing. They've had money sitting in checking accounts, large amounts of money sitting in checking accounts, not knowing what to do with it. And then just like you said, you teach them and, and you bring them along in the process and, and you invite them uh, into an opportunity. And sometimes it works. Uh, you know, sometimes they agree. 
sometimes sometimes it's not the right time and and that's okay but um yeah i, I just just want to yeah just echo that private money has been absolutely instrumental for me in in building my portfolio um so can you talk me through um let's say somebody's listening to this and they say yeah, I mean, it must be nice to be Jay. It must be nice to to be Jonathan and have a bunch of rich family members looking to throw hundreds of thousands of dollars around. I don't know anyone with money. I don't have anyone in my network who has any money or would be willing to lend. What do you have to say to, to those people? Uh, well, first of all, I don't believe them. <laughs> because, and when someone says all my people are broke or I don't know anybody with money, what I, what I've discovered, Jonathan, is really most of the time what they're saying is, I don't know anybody with money that I'm comfortable talking with, is what they're really saying, right? So we got to get comfortable, right? And how do you get comfortable? You get comfortable by getting uncomfortable, by becoming comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? Anything you do for the very first time, of course, is going to be uncomfortable. So what do you say? Well, first of all, you know, one of the first things uh, people ask say, Jay, how do I start? How do, how do I start? I can tell you how you start. You start raising private money by first owning the real estate between your ears before trying to own any real estate out there. So it's all a mindset. So what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, we got to get clear in our head. We are not chasing, begging, selling, persuading, or trying to talk anybody to anything. Why is that? Because once you understand that there's so much more money out there than there are deals, and there really is. I mean, I've got more private money right now than I can use for, for, for the deals. And so if you are listening to this show and you're saying, I don't know anybody with money, um, and I agree. I mean, some, you know, some of us do not have as a large of a network as other people do. So how do you grow your network? Really? How do you grow your network? And we all know that there's a direct correlation between your network and the value of your network and your net worth, of course. And so I teach people how to grow their network very, very quickly the way I have grown my network. So how do you do that? Well, let me give you a few tips. Number one, you really want to check out BNI, which stands for Business Networking International. Uh, that was founded by Ivan Meisner. And I've been very, very involved in Business Networking International. And what it is, is all you, in fact, just you just Google BNI.com and you're going to find local uh, chapters in your area. They're all over the nation. They're all over the world. I mean, I live here in Moorhead city, North Carolina population, 8,000 people. And we got a BNI and guess what? If you don't have a BNI start a BNI and now you're automatically the go-to credibility person, right? The way BNI works is it's very different than say a civic club, like the rotary club. And I also endorse and practice and preach, get involved in the Rotary Club. But that's a much longer term play because that's building relationships. And of course, the more valuable relationships you have, then obviously the more valuable your net worth is going to grow. But with BNI, Business Networking International, that organization is for the purpose of its local members, each chapter members, giving leads to each other as to what each member is looking for. And the cool thing about Business Networking International is that truly there's only one seat per, per, per profession. For example, there's only one realtor, very coveted seat in each BNI chapter. One realtor. There's one general contractor. There's one attorney. There's one plumber. There's one HVAC. There's one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's one CPA, right? There's only one. And so that way you can be totally, uh, uh, you know, comfortable and, sec and secure in referring leads to each other. So you join the local Business Networking International uh, chapter as a real estate investor. And of course, you're going to have a visit with the local, with the realtor that's in that chapter 
to talk about how you're going to be able to give each other leads and you're not in competition with that realtor. So I could talk about B and I for the next three hours and not repeat myself, but B and I and becoming involved in the local B and I chapter is, is a very, very like overnight. I mean, I'm talking overnight scenario of growing your network. I've gotten millions of dollars in new private money of just being connected with my local B and I. And then there's, you know, it, it all comes down to becoming involved in your community, becoming involved in the local chamber of commerce. That's a long-term play that you're not getting private money overnight, but the more sincere and genuine relationships that you establish, the more private money that's going to come into your world. And here's a great big tip. Ivan Meisner coined the phrase givers gain. And what that means is when you become involved in a local association of any kind, I don't care if it's the Knights of Columbus or the Rotary Club or your local church, I've got millions of dollars from my local church members. Why is that? Because private money is founded on a five letter word that starts with the letter T and that's the word trust. People aren't investing in your deals in this world of private money. They're not investing in your deals. What are they doing? They're investing in you. They're investing in you, the operator, because they trust you. So the more trustworthy, get involved in your local community. And, oh, but what I was going to say is when you are involved in a, in, a, in a local organization, for goodness sakes, get involved in your local RIA, your, your local real estate investing association. And let me give you a great big secret sauce, big tip right now. And again, it all comes down to leading with a servant's heart, lead with a servant's heart. By the way, if you're listening to this show and you don't have the book, the go giver, go giver. If you don't have that book, then for goodness sakes, when this show is over, go to amazon.com and order it. Uh, I was so privileged to have the co-author Bob Berg on my podcast, raising private money uh, a few months ago. It all comes down to being a servant. For example, how do you apply that uh, when you're in a local organization? I don't care what it is. Volunteer to serve. Volunteer to serve. Genuinely, genuinely volunteer to serve. If you're involved in your local real estate investor association, which you should be, volunteer to check people in or go to the, the leader of the group and say, look, I want to become involved in this association, this group. How can I serve? What do you need help with? And I promise you they need help, right? Because it's all volunteer. And I mean, it's just what Jesus said. The first becomes last and the last becomes first. You genuinely offer to serve and volunteer in these, in these groups and you are going to rise to the top. The cream comes to the to the top of those that are volunteering. And I mean, you become seen as a go-to person that's genuinely interested in other people. And you're going to have the attractor factor instead of being a taker, you're going to be seen as a giver. Really powerful stuff. There are some fantastic, very tangible suggestions. And I want to reiterate that um, it is not when you're getting involved in organizations and volunteering, it is not transactional. It's not, hey, I signed up for, you know, to check people in at the front desk. And so now, hey, do you want to invest in my deal? It's not transactional. It's long term. It's uh, it's value for value. It's it's giving to each other. And um, I also had Bob Berg on this podcast uh, a few months ago. Awesome guy. Privileged to have him on. Um, definitely have a, has a servant's heart. And um, yeah, Go Giver, awesome, um, awesome book uh, for this context as well. So let's get down to some nitty gritty. If someone is considering this and saying, okay, maybe I've got an uncle or a neighbor that um, I, could, um, I, could, I could teach or I could invite into an opportunity, um, what sort of terms are we talking about? What's reasonable? What are the going terms for uh, lending on, on a deal? So the going terms is whatever you decide the going terms are. So I'll share what my going terms are. And Jonathan, I have been offering these same terms with no variance ever since February, 2009, same terms. And you know, people, I'm, I'm going to share what those terms are here in a second, but 
in recent times, I mean, you know, our market is a little crazy. You know, interest rates have gone up out of the ceiling uh, in, re in recent times, months, and a couple of years. And one common question, Jonathan, and I get from other real estate investors is, Jay, how in the world are you paying the same interest rate to your lenders today when interest rates have gone up out of the ceiling that you were paying in 2009? And I say, well, here's, there's two answers to that question as to how and why I'm doing that. Number one, as I've said, I make the rules as the borrower. It's my program. So I'm paying the same thing. And number two, they say, but Jay, interest rates have gone up. Yeah, they've gone up. But guess what? I pay 8%. I started paying 8% in February, 2009. I still pay 8% today with no origination fees, no points, no extension fees, et cetera. And they say, well, how are you doing that? The same since 2009 and interest rates have gone up out of the ceiling here in recent months and years. I said, well, guess what? 8% is still a whole lot better than 4%, which you can get at First Citizens Bank right down here on Bridges Street in Moorhead City, North Carolina for a 12 month certificate of deposit. Well, look, prior to COVID, a 12-month certificate of deposit uh, yielded 0.17% was the national average, 0.17% prior to COVID. That same bank today is offering 4%. But guess what? I'm paying 8%, which is double what they can get at the local bank. Of course, it was about 40 times that prior to COVID. Um, so 8%. 8% uh, simple interest, not compounded. Now that's 8% APR, annual percentage rate. That's not, if, if I use the money for six months, I'm not paying 8% for borrowing the money in six months. I'm paying 4%, right, of that time I use the money. So it's an 8% annual percentage rate. The length of the note, the promissory note is two years, two years. Um, I typically don't use the money two years because most of the time I'm flipping a single family house, but two years is what it is. No extension fees, zero extension fees. That's in contrast to say a hard money lender. I mean, for goodness sakes, hard money. I mean, my private lenders don't even want the money back. I mean, when I cash out the first deal that I've borrowed money on them and I'll say, look, you know, real estate attorney is going to be mailing you a payoff check. They say, can't you just keep the money? And I say, no, I can't keep the money because I'm not going to borrow unsecured funds. That's another part of the program. We do not borrow uh, unsecured funds. We always collateralize every note uh, here in North Carolina. It's a deed of trust. Most people call it a mortgage. The maximum, um, the maximum loan to value is 75% of the after repaired value. I did not say 75% of purchase price. That's a big difference. So 75% of the after repaired value, um, no extension fees, of course. And uh, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Um, I offer people what's called a 90 day call option in the promissory note, which means that they've got some kind of emergency that comes up. They can give me notice uh, prior to the note coming due and um, they can get their money back in case of an emergency. Uh, that gives me plenty of time to replace their money with another private lender's money. Uh, most people uh, would have to pay a penalty uh, for calling the note due early. I mean, if you, if you pull money out of a CD early in the bank, you've got to pay a penalty. But in my program, there is no penalty. I want to keep it simple for our private lenders to do business with us. Um, and I mean, quite frankly, I just want to keep it very, very simple. And, and at the end of the day, after all these years, I've only had two notes called due early. Both of them were small notes at $30,000 and they had medical emergencies. The fact of the matter is the private lenders don't want their money back because if they get their money back, they're not making any money or return unless they've got it invested. But that's in essence, uh, essentially what the program looks like. I connect with everything that you're saying. Um, it's uh, largely been my experience that when I pay lenders back, they're actually mad at me for paying them back because, you know, otherwise the money's likely just going to be sitting in an account and uh, not doing anything. Whereas the, the money returns that 
I can pay them, they can't really get anywhere else easily. And so they are happy to keep their money uh, with uh, someone that they trust, someone that they knew they know are doing good deals. Um, and so that's that's really been my experience as well. You had talked about securitizing the money. And I know that that could be a concern for lenders and investors. How how am I going to be insured that I get my money back? So you talked about a promissory note. You talked about a deed of trust or a mortgage. So can you, uh, for people that are unfamiliar, can you just kind of go through why uh, that the, the PN and uh, a deed of trust is so important to this process? Sure. So the reason that the promissory note is so important is because you don't want to work off of memory as to what your deal is and what your agreement is. So a promissory note lays out the agreement. Uh, the promissory note is a very, very simple document. Um, by the way, you always want your documents, your closing documents prepared by your real estate attorney. Even if you're in a state where you use title companies to close real estate deals, well, title companies are used to getting closing packages from the lender. Well, guess what? Your private lender doesn't even know what a closing package is. So, of course, your real estate attorney is going to prepare the promissory note, the deed of trust, or the mortgage. So the promissory note lays out your agreement. Who's the borrower? That's you, your entity. Who's the lender? That's your private lender or your private lender's self-directed IRA account because they can use retirement funds as well to do this. Uh, it's going to lay out what's the loan amount. That's the principal loan amount. It's going to have in the promissory note, what's the interest rate. It's going to have the frequency of payments. Are you paying monthly? Are you paying quarterly? Are you paying semi-annual? Or are you just letting the interest accrue? I mean, think about fixing your cash flow. What if you just borrowed the money and didn't have to make any payments? If you're doing a flip on a single family house and you just let the interest accrue, and you cash them out and pay them off when you sell the property. Um, 90 day call option. If you're giving the, uh, that option to where they can call the note due early, that would be in the promissory note. Obviously the promissory note is going to have the address as to where payments are sent and et cetera. The deed of trust or the mortgage is the document that collateralizes or secures that note. So what does the mortgage or deed of trust do? It gives your lender the legal right to foreclose on that note if you don't pay them. You know, one popular question I get, Jonathan, is um, new real estate investors will say, well, who in the world is going to loan me money on real estate and I've never done a deal? Well, here's the answer to that question. If you as the borrower don't pay them, the property does. So when you don't borrow more than 75% of the after repaired value, if they had to foreclose on you. And for goodness sakes, I hope they wouldn't have to foreclose on you. If your deal went sideways, just give them a deed in lieu, right? And they've got the property. Of course, they don't want the property. But they don't want to mess with the property. They, they want you. That's why they got you. They want you to take care of it. But that is the lender's legal recourse. If you don't pay them, that gives them the legal right to foreclose on that note. Now, how else are your lenders protected? Well, we're going to name them, the lender, as the mortgagee on the insurance policy. You know, if you borrow money from the local bank for your primary residence, that bank is going to name, I mean, the insurance company, uh, the bank is going to be required to be named as the mortgagee on the insurance policy. So what does that do? Well, that's another layer of protection for your lender. If there's ever a claim against that insurance policy, Guess who the insurance company is going to make the check payable to you, the borrower and to your lender, which means your lender's got to sign off on that check, that insurance check before you get the money. And we're also going to name the lender on the title policy as an additional insured in case there's any title issues down the road, then the lender is protected there as well. So conservative loan to value mortgagee on the insurance policy, um, they are having a deed of trust or a mortgage to secure the note. And again, with all that protection at the end of the day, they're still putting their trust in you, the operator to perform. Yeah. Great, great synopsis there. And you 
clearly are a skilled teacher. I mean, the, the way you explain things is just very clear and easy to understand. So definitely appreciate that. And um, yeah, as we get to the tail end of our conversation here, um, I want to ask you, is there anyone or any type of person that you know that private money lending is not right for? I know you you teach this and so you have students or have you ever met anyone or a personality type and you said, you know what, you should probably not be doing this right now? <laughs> That's a great question. And, you know, I've been a guest on over 700 podcasts, Jonathan, and I've never been asked that question. <laughs> uh, so kudos to you to coming up with a brand new question. So the question is, have I ever visited with a private potential, potential private lender that I ended up saying, you know, I don't think this is for you? No, and the answer I, I'm wondering, you, you can answer that. What I'm getting at is an investor, you or me, somebody who wants to flip a house and, um, you know, they're not a good fit for using private money. You, you oh. can answer both, but I'm really interested. And in, is there, are there people out there who maybe should maybe be going to the bank or using a hard money lender or finding other financial sources and not using private money? I misunderstood your question, but now I understand it. Um, I haven't been asked that question either. So there's two, two, one misunderstood question and one understood question. Um, that is a great question. Let me think about that for a second. Should, uh, yes, yes, yes. I can tell you exactly who should not be borrowing private money. You as an investor, you as a borrower, you should not be borrowing private money until you know what in the flip you're doing with your real estate deals, right? I mean, for goodness sakes, don't borrow somebody's money, even with the security on a real estate deals until first of all, first of all, do you know what is the formula as to what the maximum you should pay for a property using somebody's money? Well, you better know. <laughs> I mean, because here's the deal emotions should never be involved in the decision on how much to pay for a property. The math, here's a writer downer. If you're taking notes on this show, the math makes the decision, not your emotions, the math, the math, the calculation of, of, you know, wh what's the, what's the value? I mean, how are you getting your values? So um, to, 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 to really shorten up this answer, Jonathan, I do not recommend for any real estate investor to be borrowing private money until first you understand the basics, not the basics, until you understand what should you be paying for a property, how to manage that property. If a rehab is involved, you know, for goodness sakes, you know, the worst time to be, I mean, the worst time to be looking for private money is when you need it for a deal, right? So I want to, I want to put those relationships together up front, but at the same time, you know, if you're looking at renovating properties like I do, the worst time to be looking for a general contractor is when you need it for a property that you already bought that's sitting out there waiting for the, so, so get educated, <laughs> work with somebody that's already doing the business that's got experience. Don't, Hey, listen, don't do what I did. Do not make the mistake I made. I started investing in real estate before I even had a coach or a mentor. And I was just trying to read books and do this business. And I made some very costly, very painful mistakes by not getting educated and working with somebody that knows what they're doing. So that's a very long answer to a very short question. Uh, but your, your question is who should not be borrowing private money. You should not be borrowing private money until you're ready to borrow private money because you've been educated on how to do the, 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 the segment of real estate that you're interested in. Jay, let's take your question now. Have you ever had any conversations with potential lenders? And uh, maybe it's someone you don't know. Maybe, maybe it is a friend or a family member. And they say, yeah, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm interested in, in lending on this deal. I love 8%. Um, and then you get into more conversation. And then maybe something goes off in your head that tells you, oh, this, 
this person should probably not be lending this money. Has that ever happened? Uh, one time. Uh, one time. And uh, so here, here's the summary of that conversation. So I had been referred, or this person rather, had been referred to me by one of my existing private lenders. And that's what's going to happen. You'll start using private money for your real estate deals and private lenders refer other people, right? I mean, private lenders can't keep their mouth, their mouth shut. Say my lands, my lands, I'm, I'm Jay Connors paying me 8%. And you know, their friends getting 4% down at the bank. And so now they want to find out about this. So I was visiting with this person, uh, about being a, a potential private lender. And very quickly, I started picking up on the notion that this person wants to get really involved in the deals themselves. They want to go look at the properties. They want to see what the budget sheet is from the general contractor. And they want to be involved in what I do. And so I told them pretty quickly at the beginning of the conversation, I said, you know, it sounds to me like you don't want to be a private lender. It sounds to me like you want to be a real estate investor, uh, which I am. So if you want to find the deals and you want to negotiate the deals and you want to negotiate with the general contractors, what the, what the, you know, what their bid is going to be in the scope of work, then don't be a private lender. A private lender is totally passive to where all they do is loan money and their money is secured. And all they do is sit back and make high rates of return safely and securely. If you want to go over here and get involved in the deals, then be a real estate investor. Don't be a private lender. They became a private lender. So, okay. <laughs> so I mean, the, the, the person that wants to get, you know, you know, where are you getting your deals and, you know, negotiate the deals? Well, go be a real estate investor. You don't want to be a private lender. Go get in the business and, you know, do what I do. And so part of my conversation with that potential private lender was, you know, what I've learned over the years is, too many cooks in the kitchen burns the toast. I do what I do best, which is oversee deals, find deals, negotiate deals, and put the deals together. And what my private lenders do best is loan money, make high rates of return safely and securely, and sit back and be passive and let me do my job. That's how everybody stays happy. Jay, this has been a great really all encompassing conversation about using private money to fund our real estate deals. And you've gone through great detail and given some great examples. Um, as we wrap up the conversation, I want to give you the opportunity to share anything that we haven't touched on that you feel like listeners should know. I know um, you have some students and you teach this. Um, and so I want to give you the opportunity to share with listeners if they want to learn more about you and learn more about how to get involved in private money lending, where should they go? Thank you so much, Jonathan. Well, you know, quite frankly, we've just really touched the hem of the garment to tell you the truth in this world of private money. And Jonathan, what I want to share and offer with your audience is I'm so excited about my brand new seven day private money challenge that I just finished recording and launched. And what this is, is it's seven days of video trainings that's only 15 to 20 minutes long on each one they're not long very very easy to follow and so if you're listening to this show and you really want to learn how to get a lot of private money for your real estate deals very very quickly then all you got to do is go over to www.jayconner j-a-y-c-o-n-n-e-r.com and i'm an er not an o-r so jayconner.com forward slash seven days and that's the numeral seven and that will give you access to my seven day private money challenge that will show you how to get a ton of private money very very quickly again that's j connor j a y c o n n e r dot com forward slash seven days and i promise you not only are you going to get a lot of private money we're going to have a lot of fun doing it together and uh, listeners, that link is in the show notes right now. Jay, thank you so much for joining me. I really enjoyed this conversation talking about the power that private money can bring to a real estate portfolio. Thank you so much for joining me today. Jonathan, thank you so much for having me. God bless you. 
Listeners, if you enjoyed this conversation, feel free to reach out to either one of us. We love talking about real estate and we would love to connect with you. We have another great interview coming next week, so be sure to come back here. Until next time. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's J-C-O-N-N-E-R.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.